Good morning. Today's lecture will be on epithelial tissues. With epithelial tissues, just as a review, we're looking at a collection of specialized cells that perform a limited number of functions. Some of the characteristics that we see in epithelial tissues are going to be uh, first cellularity, which is composes almost the entire uh, cells bound together by interconnections known as cell junctions. Also, what we see in other characteristics is polarity. This simply refers to the presence of structural and functional differences between the exposed, uh, which in this case would be the apical uh, section of the cell, and the basal or the attachment between the epithelial tissue and the connective tissue. Uh, this basement membrane uh, provides physical support. Uh, it anchors to the connective tissue and it also is a barrier to regulate movement of large molecules between the epithelial tissue and connective tissue. When we're looking at the epithelial tissue, we can see a little bit of a version here. Uh, we see uh, two components of a basement membrane. There's the basal lamina, which we'll get into in a later part of the lecture, and the reticular lamina, which is directly in contact with the connective tissue and this reticular lamina contains protein fibers and carbohydrates secreted by uh, the connective tissue. These two layers of the be basement membrane strengthen the attachment and form, again, a selective molecular barrier between the epithelial tissue and the connective tissue. So what we're also looking at is that with characteristics of epithelial tissue is that it is avascular, which means that it lacks blood vessels. You can see in this illustration that the blood vessels are located uh, within the connective tissue, and we do not see any vascularization inside of the epithelial tissue. So the way that they obtain nutrients is usually through diffusion or absorption across either the exposed or the apical surface. So most of the time we see uh, ions moving uh, across um, or uh, attached between the connective tissue uh, through the epithelial structure. They also, the regeneration, the last characteristics is uh, the damaged or lost cells can be replaced through cellular division uh, through stem cells that are located uh, through the epithelium. So when we're looking at epithelial tissues, uh, its main function is to provide physical protection. So these epithelial tissues, the apical free surfaces, are under constant duress. So they're protecting internal surfaces to dehydration, abrasion, and destruction from physical or chemical agents. They're also selectively permeable, so ions that are moving uh, through the apical or free surface. They're considered to be gatekeepers. Uh, they can be impermeable to some substances and on the other hand, assisting the passage of other molecules, either through absorption or uh, secretion. They also provide sensation. So epithelial tissues are innervated by nerve endings to detect changes in the external environment at their surfaces. And they also, some of them produce a specialized secretions, uh, usually located uh, throughout the cell uh, called goblet cells, uh, through structures located in some of the epithelial tissues. And they're considered to be the exocrine glands because they're going to release uh, a mucins onto the surface of the epithelial tissue. So when we're looking at how these epithelial tissues are connected, again, just as to make sure that we have emphasis, usually what we see is the direction of ions are going to uh, come into epithelial tissue through absorption 
And these ions could be such things as glucose, amino acids, or sm small solutes. So the main thing is, is that this apical surface is going to be exposed. So this upper surface is going to be exposed to abrasion, uh, chemical agents, and it's basically going to need some type of interlocking junctions to help maintain uh, these cells uh, to remain connected. The first one that we're going to look at is this tight junction. So this one right here, there's a blown up version here. You can see what this tight junction is located near the apical surface. Um, these tight junctions force material uh, through the cell rather than between the epithelial soil cells. Um, for example, as the ions move through, it's going to force any ions to go deeper into the cell. Um, therefore, it will then be able to exchange the ions or nutrients across the lateral surfaces or pushing it further into the basal surfaces. The other thing um, that we're looking at is going to be the adhering junctions. So these adhering junctions located in both of the slides, this is a blown up version. This adhering junction has extensive microfilaments these microfilaments are going to extend. You can see the shadows in this illustration, but they extend into the lateral surface of the adjacent uh, cell. And these microfilaments are extending uh, into the plasma membrane. Their job is to help support the tight junction, uh, but they also, this is the first area where we see that there is the ability for um, any ions that have passed through the apical surface that they can actually make their way across this adhering junction uh, through the lateral surface uh, of a neighboring membrane. The next one we'll look at is going to be the desmosome. So we're just going to be going a little bit deeper into the cell. There's two illustrations of a desmosome. Uh, the first one is here and then the blown up version and this model would be right here. The desmosome, it its main job is to provide resistance to mechanical st stress and attaches to its neighboring cells at specific stress points. Um, so depending on where the stress points are going to be, it can dictate whether or not the desmosome is going to be slightly higher or lower. These desmosomes are important also uh, because each one of the cells is going to um, contribute to the desmosome. So we can see in this blown up picture that one cellular membrane is going to have the protein filaments, protein plaques, the intermediate filaments, and the plasma membrane. And the other side of the cell is going to contribute the other half of these structures that I just mentioned. But their main job is going to be for mechanical stress. So as mentioned earlier, we also have um, the ability for lateral exchange of ions across. These lateral exchange of ions across are going to be mostly located through the gap junction. The first part of the gap junction is that the two cells are held together by interlocking junctional proteins, and those proteins are going to be connexons. These connexons, there's usually about six of them, and with inside of the connexon, we're going to see uh, an opening or a pore that leads from one cellular membrane across into another cellular membrane. Uh, the pores are important for ion exchange, so we see a lot of ion exchange that are going to occur across these gap junctions. And finally, we see the attachment at the basement membrane uh, called a hemodesmosome. These hemodesmosomes, they represent kind of a half button, so the contribution of the protein filaments and intermediate filaments are only coming from the cell the basement membrane does not contribute. So in this hemodesmosome, it's just providing an anchor point um, 
for uh, these uh, filaments to attach from the cell to the basal lamina or the first surface of this basal lamina of the basement membrane. The next part is just going to be the basic classifications of epithelial tissue. Uh, there are three classifications. Uh, this illustration shows two of them. We see the simple epithelial and the classifications are usually done in epithelial tissues by the number of cellular layers. So when we look at the simple epithelial, you can see that it's a thin, a very thin, uh, one layer, <clears throat> um, one layer of cells that cover over the top of the basal lamina. And again, the basement membrane consists of a basal lamina and a reticular lamina that's connecting into the connective tissue. So with this simple epithelial, some of the characteristics that it has is um, that it's going to be fragile. It's usually located in protected areas inside of the body. Uh, we find these, for instance, in gas exchange surfaces of the lungs, uh, through blood vessels, and the heart chambers. They're highly diffusible, so ions can exchange into the connective tissue uh, very easily and readily, and vice versa, things can move out of the cell uh, very easily. The next classification that we see is going to be the stratified epithelial. And there's usually two different types. We can see, based off of their structure, we can see the stratified squamous epithelial, and that's just basically um, kind of a hexagonal shape. Uh, we usually see these type of epithelial uh, located in mostly areas that have large or severe amounts of mechanical stresses. Um, we also have a type of stratified epithelial called a pseudostratified epithelial where we see that the nuclei are, are distributed through different levels from the apical to the basal surfaces. Uh, the main thing is, is that with a stratified epithelial tissue is that it's a layering effect. So in this air illustration we can see that we have one layer and then we have a slightly different shape of the cells in the second layer and then we have the third layer, and then we have the basement membrane, and then below that would be the connective tissue. Uh, but we'll delineate the different types of uh, stratified epithelial tissue here in a second. So they can also be classified by the cellular shape. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the squamous epithelial cell usually are flat in shape. They're usually wide, sometimes somewhat irregular. Um, I usually easily remember this as kind of like a fried egg. The nucleus is usually bulging slightly at the apical surface. We see a cuboidal cell. The next one, there are cubes. Uh, they're as tall as they are wide. Uh, the nucleus can be distributed in the center, slightly off center, uh, but most of the time uh, they're equally shaped as far as height versus width. And then the columnar, uh, they're slender and tall rather than wider. And most of the time we see the nucleus uh, located a little bit deeper in the cell. And the last classification of the shapes is going to be a transitional. And transitional, you can just think of a transitional cell looking... Um, very irregular, so it doesn't have a uniform shape like these three. So what we're going to be doing over the course of the next few presentations is just a little bit of an overview. Uh, this gives you a little bit of an idea of all the different types of epithelial tissues. In this first part, we're going to be focusing on uh, the simple epithelial. As mentioned, it's a one layer of cell. Uh, but there's different subgroups, such as the simple squamous, a simple cuboidal, super simple columnar, and then pseudostratified columnar. So each one of these have distinct characteristics, and we'll also be able to go uh, through their functions and their locations.
The other type of epithelial tissue that we see are stratified. And again, stratified just means multi-layered. <clears throat> and the only the deepest cellular layer is in contact with the basement membrane, which is connected to the connective tissue. So again, we have we see the cellular shapes such as the squamous, the stratified cuboidal, the columnar, and then as mentioned earlier to the transitional, which are usually irregular. There is one difference between the stratified or delineations between the stratified. We see that there's a keratinized and a non-keratinized. So we're really just looking at the types of epithelial tissues uh, based off of their structure, function, and of course their location in the human body. So the first one we'll take a look at is going to be the simple squamous epithelial tissue. And I'll just bring your attention to this very top. This very thin top layer, the single layer of flat cells, um, is what we're going to be mostly focused on. Again, it can be a little bit irregular shaped. Um, they resemble, I always think of a, a fried egg. Um, there's a single nucleus located inside each one of the cells. Their main function is for rapid diffusion, so it allows ions such as oxygen and carbon dioxide to move very quickly across the squamous cell. Um, their also job, their job is for filtration, uh, and in in some areas we see for uh, secretion, such as in the serous membranes. We find these in the air sacs of the lungs, lining of the heart chambers, and the lumen of the blood vessels, specifically the endothelium. The next one, again, based off of this uh, simple shape, we see the simple cuboidal. Uh, it has a hexag hex hexagonal shape to it. Uh, so when we're looking at the simple cuboidal, I'll just point one out here. You can see they're as tall as they are wide. This area is going to have the nuclei an equal distance uh, as far as the distance between the top versus the lateral surface. With the simple cuboidal epithelial tissue, uh, we usually see it as a single layer of cells. Um, their function is going to be absorption and secretion. We find these cells located in the kidney tubules. We also see these in the thyroid gland, uh, the ducts of any secretion regions of most glands, um, and also the surface of the ovaries. The next one is going to be the non-ciliated simple columnar epithelial. Uh, again, we're looking at a single layer, but we're going to have a couple of extra functions or structures that are different uh, from the cuboidal. So the non-ciliated columnar epithelial, uh, again, they're hexagonal in shape. Uh, they have an elongated nuclei, and usually they're crowded into a narrow band close to the basal lamina. So we can see here at the base of the cell, and then we have the basement membrane that the nuclei are clustered towards the basal surface of the cell. With non-ciliated columnar epithelial tissue, their job also is for absorption and secretion, except they have a new structure to be introduced and this new structure is located here and it's called the goblet cell. Their job is to secrete uh, mucin, which mixes with water onto the apical surface, which forms mucus. It also has uh, the ability to brush the mucus through uh, structures called microvilli. Uh, we see these most often in the digestive track such as the lining of the small and large intestine and we also see this in the lining of the stomach. Um, the stomach is a little bit different. It has the non-ciliated columnar epithelial but it does not have uh, these goblet cells uh, but we do see those in the small intestine and the large intestine. The next one will be the ciliated simple columnar epithelial tissue. The ciliated Simple columnar epithelial tissue uh, 
when we're looking at it, again, they're a single layer. So we're just looking at this area right here. We see that it's a single layer. Uh, this right here is going to be the basement membrane. We can actually see some blood vessels uh, where that dot is also. With the ciliated simple columnar epithelial tissue, uh, we also see that the nuclei are orientated lengthwise and they're usually located in the basal region. So they're usually closer to the basement membrane of the cell. Their function is also, they have the ability for secretion of mucins and the movement of mucus along the apical surface. And they move the mucus through structures along the surface called microvilli. Um, or by cilia, excuse me. Uh, we also we see these located within the lining of the uterine tubes, uh, large bronchioles of the respiratory tract. Moving forward, we have the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial. Uh, with the pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue, what we see is a single layer of cells. They have varying heights. So we'll just use this illustration down here. They, each cell has a varying height um, that appears to be multi-layered, uh, but it's actually a little bit deceiving, but each one of these cells is connected individually to the basement membrane. They do take on a multi-layer shape, uh, but they are single-layered in nature. They have goblet cells, which was mentioned earlier, that produce mucins. These also have cilia, which allow for the mucins uh, to mix with water, which forms mucus. We see these most often in the respiratory tract. Um, first off, their function is for protection. Uh, their job is to move the mucus uh, to prevent any type of abnormal uh, pathogen that comes into the respiratory system to be moved out, usually expired through coughing. So we see these most often in the respiratory tract. Uh, we also see these in the nasal cavities. Uh, portions of the pharynx, which is the back of the throat, the larynx, we also see these found in the tracheae, uh, trachea and the bronchi. The next one we'll be looking at is uh, the stratified squamous epithelial, and there's two different types. We see that the keratinized and the non-keratinized. So the first one we'll take a look at here is going to be on this side of the slideshow, which is going to be here, which is going to be the keratinized. So with the keratinized, um, we're getting now into the multi-layered. Uh, so we can see here that this first area of the squamous epithelial cells are going to be multi-layered. So this multi-layered, what we tend to see is uh, the basal cells are typically are cuboidal, uh, they, whereas the apical or superficial cells are squamous. So where I've charted out here, this would be the apical surface. This is usually squamous. Um, this would be the basal layer here, coming down, kind of the dark purple. And uh, these are going to be more in a cuboidal shape. Their job is uh, for protection. We mostly see this in the epidermis of the skin. Uh, so you can see a little bit of the um, skin here as it peels away. So for example, if you get a sunburn, these keratinized squamous or stratified squamous epithelial tissue, the keratinized will just simply peel off and then the basement membrane will divide producing new cells that will eventually migrate to the surface. It's an interesting fact, we lose anywhere between one and two pounds of skin per year. Uh, the next one is going to be a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Again, they're multi-layered. Um, so we see the upper portion is going to be uh, squamous in shape. 
uh, as far as the superficial cells. And then the basal cells are going to be more kind of a cuboidal or in a regular shape. Um, the surface cells on these structures are going to be alive. So when we're looking at these cells, we're going to see that these cells are going to be uh, kept alive through um, mucus or moisture. Their job is protection of the underlying tissue below. Uh, we see this in your oral cavity, the back of the throat, such as the pharynx and the esophagus. Uh, we also see this in the lining of the vagina and also uh, the lining of the anus. The next one is going to be the stratified cuboidal epithelial tissue. Um, this one is going to be two or more cells uh, with the stratified cuboidal epithelial tissue. So in this one we're going to see here, we can see in this illustration that it's multi-layered. Um, cells typically at the apical surface or near the uh, exposed surface are going to be cuboidal in shape. Their function is going to be protection and secretion. We find this in the larger ducts in most of the exocrine glands and in some parts of the male urethra. Uh, one of the exocrine glands that they give an example is going to be the sweat glands. Moving on, we have the stratified columnar epithelial tissue, and again pointing out when we're really identifying different types of cells, this is going to be a columnar in shape. Uh, we see that it's multi-layered or two or more layers. Uh, cells at the apical surface tend to be more columnar. So we can see here, I'll just put a little line kind of to the division. Uh, anything up here would be more of the uh, towards the apical surface or columnar cells. Uh, their job is for protection and secretion. Uh, their location is extremely rare, uh, or they're not found in many parts of the human body. Uh, we most often find this in the male urethra. So it's a very specialized cell. And finally, we have the transitional epithelial. And earlier I was mentioning it has a multi-layered um, and atypical cellular shape. Um, they can be stretched. They're very resilient. So they can be stretched, pulled apart. You can see that some of them are binucleated inside. This picture is showing kind of a relaxed version of the transitional cell. So they're multi-layered. They can be descended, recoiled, depending uh, how much they can be uh, stretched. We tend to see these the functions for um, mostly in the urinary bladder, the ureters, and the urethra, so portions of the uh, urinary system. And their job is to expand and to contract. So this example is giving the urinary bladder so as the urine fills up in the urinary bladder, we'll see these cells having the ability to stretch. And that concludes the lecture on epithelial tissues. Thank you.